All right, welcome back everybody. And today we're going to be using complex analysis to evaluate this infinite sum running from k equals one to infinity of one over k squared plus a squared where a is some positive real number. So this is going to be very similar to the Basel problem video, link up here or in the description. Um, I'm not going to go through too much detail in this video as to how things work out and whatnot. Um, a more detailed explanation can be found in the Basel problem video. Um, and that's just because those two sums are more or less the same thing. This is just, I guess, a bit more of a generalization on the Basel problem. So let's just jump straight in. So we wanted to find some kind of function f of z uh, that we're going to be contour integrating across. And whenever you're dealing with sums like these, a nice function to choose is f of z being equal to pi times the cotangent of pi z multiplied by whatever's inside the sum, but replace your index with z. So we're going to have a z squared plus a squared instead of a k squared plus a squared. And um, I guess what this function outside here does is it gives you poles at the integers. And the nice thing about the, those poles at the in integers generated by this function is that the residue is equal to one, which means that if you take the residue of this whole entire function right here, in fact, what you get is just whatever's in, inside your um, inside of your sum. So I guess a quick demonstration of this, if you take the residue at z being equal to k, where k is some integer of the function f of z, what you get, well, this is a, well, all, all the poles at the integers are simple poles. So you can just use the definition for the simple pole residue. So the limit as z approaches each of those poles, so z approaches k of z minus the pole, so z minus k times the function f of z, which is pi times the cotangent of pi z times one over z squared plus a squared. And if we evaluate this limit right here, um, let's try to split up this cotangent a little bit because cotangent is nothing but cosine divided by sine. I guess I'll divide this sine right here. And notice as z approaches k, this numerator part right here that goes to zero. And as z approaches k down here, the sine of, well, it becomes sine of zero, which is zero. So in fact, right here, you get a zero divided by zero situation. So we can look at all that. So now this is equal to, if we split up the limits and everything, this is going to give us the limits as z approaches k. Now differentiating the top right here, we're going to get one over differentiating the bottom, we're going to get pi times the cosine of pi z. Okay, so that's, I guess, the first part of the limit. And then we also have the limit on this other factor right here. So the limit as z approaches k of, now we have pi times the cosine of pi z times one over z squared plus a squared. And nothing's going to blow up right here or go to zero as z approaches k. So we can literally just sub k into all of these z's right here. And as for this first limit right here, well, we can carry on. We can just plug k into the z. Nothing will blow up. So we're going to get one over pi times the cosine of pi times k. That's the first limit done. Then for the second limit, we're going to get pi times the cosine of pi z times one over, now the z is going to turn into a k, so k squared plus a squared. And you see pi cosine pi k, um, actually this is supposed to be a k right here because we took the limit as z approaches k. These two factors right here, they cancel each other out. And notice that these two actually come from pi cotangent pi z. So that's um, the reason it's nice to use this function because the residue is equal to one. So in fact, if you evaluate the residue at the integers on this function, all you get at the end is one over k squared plus a squared like so. And this is really nice because now if we sum the residues, then we're literally just summing these terms right here, which is exactly what we're doing. So we know that the residues um, at the integers of our function f of z evaluates to one over k squared plus a squared. 
Okay, so those are the residues at the integers that are generated by this cotangent, but there are also um, poles that are generated by this other factor right here, 1 over z squared plus a squared. And we also have to evaluate the residues at those poles as well. So now, I guess, in order to figure out what the other poles are, we just let the denominator equal to 0. So let z squared um, plus a squared equals to 0. And that means that z squared is equal to minus a squared. So if you take the square root on both sides, consider the plus or minus, that's going to be plus or minus i times a. Okay, so we know where two other poles are, I guess. So now we just have to evaluate the residues at those poles. So let's evaluate the residue at z equals, let's take the positive one, so i times a of f of z. Well, that's going to be, again, those are simple poles. So we're going to have the limits as z approaches i times a of z minus the pole, so z minus i a, multiplied by our function f of z, so multiplied by pi cotangent of pi z times one over z squared plus a squared. Okay, and where can we go from here? Well, notice that z squared plus a squared, we can in fact factor that a little bit. That's going to be one over z minus i a and z plus i a. So that's this difference of two squares right there. You can um, check it for yourself that this denominator is in fact equal to z squared plus a squared. And the nice thing about doing that is that you can cancel this factor with this factor. Another, may, another way you could do it is by using L'Hopital's again, but I guess this is just a little bit nicer to do. So now if you take the limit, let's keep going over here. If you take the limit on this thing, well, we have this pi, then we also have this cotangent of pi times z, but z is going to turn into i a, so you're going to get i times a times pi. And then on this other factor right here, well, those two are gone, so if you let z approach i times a, you're going to get 2 times i times a down here. Uh, so I guess you're going to divide by 2 times i times a. Okay, and where can we go from here? Well, notice that cotangent, we can split that up into sines and cosines. So if we continue on down here, this is now equal to pi over 2 times i times a of, well, times cosine of i times a times pi over the sine of i times a times pi. And what I want to do now is I want to turn these cosines and sines into their hyperbolic versions. So for the cosine, if you want to turn cosine into hyperbolic cosine, what you do is you get rid of this i, but you can't just get rid of that i, you just, you have to turn the cosine into cosh. So we get rid of this i and we turn the cosine into cosh, and then we have whatever's remaining. As for the sine, what we do is we pull this i out to the front and we turn the sine into a singe. So now we have i times singe of whatever's left inside, so a times pi. And I guess now we can simplify things a little bit. i times i, that's going to give us a negative. And then we have pi over 2a. And then we're left with cosh over singe, but that's exactly coth. So coth of a times pi, like so, and um, that's pretty much it. So this thing right here, that's the residue at the pole IA of f of z. So let's write that down. So now the residue at IA is equal to minus pi over 2a times hyperbolic cotangent of a times pi. So that's quite nice. And now we just have to do the same thing. We have to do the same residue calculation for the negative pole right here. So let's find the residue at z equals minus ia of f of z. That's going to give us, uh, the process is going to be pretty much the same thing. So those are simple poles once again. So we're going to have the limits as z approaches minus ia of z minus the pole. But because this is a negative pole, we're going to have z plus ia times the function f of z, which is pi, times the cotangent of pi z, times 1 over, and now we can factor this again, um, just to save some space, so this is z minus ia and z plus ia, and notice once again, 
these factors cancel each other out and taking the limit right here well you're going to get pi times the cotangent of well z is going to turn into minus i a so we're going to have minus i times a times pi in here and as for this factor in here let's see we have minus i a minus i a so that's minus 2 i a so this is divided by minus 2 um, i times a and again we can split up that cotangent a little bit because that's equal to um, let's see pi over minus 2 times i times a times the cosine of minus i times a times pi divided by the sine of minus i times a times pi but notice that the cosine is an even function so cosine of a negative something is the same thing as cosine of the positive something so we can literally just ignore this negative and sine is an odd function so we can pull this negative out to the front and cancel with this negative at um, negative right here so we're going to be left with pi over 2 times i times a so this negative will be cancelled when we get rid of the negative inside of this sign and we're going to have cosine of i times a times pi over the sine of i times a times pi and again we can use some hyperbolic identities turning these cosines and sines into the hyperbolic versions so for cosine again if we want to turn cosine into cosh, we have to get rid of this i. So now we have pi times the cosh of um, a times pi divided by. And for the singe, once again, if we want to turn sine into singe, we pull the i out to the front. And if we pull the i out to the front, then we're going to have i times i, which is negative. So negative right there. Then we're going to have 2a. This sign turns into a singe. So we have singe of a times pi and again cos cos over singe is um cough so hyperbolic cotangent so overall the residue at this negative pole is in fact the same thing so we have let's see minus pi over 2a so it's minus pi over 2a cos over singe that's cough of a times pi okay very nice so we've basically found all the poles of this function f of z and we know the residues at each of those poles and now let's sum up all the residues because we can use Cauchy's uh, residue theorem we know that if we sum the residues so if we sum all the residues of f of z and if we multiply this by 2 times pi times i that's going to be equal to the contour integral mm -hmm. over some contour c of f of z dz and this z c right here um, that's not showing on the camera i'll bring that down a little bit this is equal to the contour integral over some contour c of f of z dz and this c is some contour that encloses all of the poles we found so if we draw up a little picture we were going to be using a square contour um, I'm not going to go over the um, contour calculation in this video it's going to take way too long but a square contour uh, with side lengths well I guess this length right here is some n plus a half and we typically call this contour s sub n so a square um, of some relationship with n so this is n plus a half so this whole side length is a 2n plus 1 and we have all these residues on the integers and then we also have a two extra um, poles plus or minus i times a so this is i a minus i a and we can actually show that in the limit as n approaches infinity on this contour integral over s sub n it actually goes to zero and the proof of that you can find on the Basel problem video. Uh, it's going to be slightly different because we have this extra z squared plus a squared on the denominator. But you can just use some triangle inequality and you more or less get the same result as what we do on the Basel problem video. So in fact, the contour integral of this function over some square um, under this limit right here, that goes to zero. So what we can say is that by Cauchy's residue theorem, if you sum up all the residues of this function, it's going to give you zero. And of course, this two pi i is irrelevant. Um, so 
now if we sum up all the residues it should give you zero and these are all our residues right here so first of all we have the sum and notice these residues those are all the residues of the integers so you have to sum through all the integers first so these are all the residues at the integers so 1 over k squared plus a squared so that's the sum along the integers and then we also have the residues at those two other poles so minus pi over 2a times the hyperbolic cotangent of a times pi but we have that twice so we're just going to multiply by 2 out here and that's going to give us a zero so we guess we get that the sum running from well k along the integers of 1 over k squared plus a squared is equal to now moving this term onto the other side getting rid of this negative we're going to get um, these twos will cancel each other out as well we're going to get pi over a hyperbolic cotangent of a times pi and um, where can we go from here well notice that our original sum starts from k equals 1 to infinity so let's split the sum up a little bit notice that we can split the sum into the sum running from well, k along the negative integers of 1 over k squared plus a squared so that's the first sum and then we also have the point at zero so if we plug k equals zero into here we're going to get one over a squared and then we also have plus the sum running from along the positive integers of one over k squared plus a squared so this sum is from minus infinity to minus one this is at zero and this is from one to infinity so overall what we have right here is equivalent to this singular sum right here um, it's just going through all the integers but notice that right here k is negative which means that when we plug a negative k values into this k squared it's going to turn positive anyway so, so in fact these sums right here these two sums are in fact equivalent to each other k being negative doesn't really affect things so since we have two of the same things we can say two times the sum running from um running along the positive integers of 1 over k squared plus a squared plus 1 over a squared is equal to pi over a times the hyperbolic cotangent of a times pi and now this k over the positive integers is more or less what we have at the very start so let's try to isolate this thing let's jump back over here so if we try to isolate this thing we get that two times the sum running from k equals 1 to infinity of 1 over k squared plus a squared um, we can subtract 1 over a squared on both sides so is equal to pi over a times the hyperbolic cotangent of a times pi minus 1 over a squared and last thing to do is divide everything by 2 so now we get that the sum running from k equals 1 to infinity of 1 over k squared plus a squared is equal to pi over 2a times the hyperbolic cotangent of a times pi minus 1 over 2a squared and this is the final result for today's video so this is quite an interesting result we have this hyperbolic function which kind of pops up which is quite interesting um, another interesting observation is that if you take the limit as a approaches zero you do in fact get pi squared over six um, even though as a approaches zero you get infinity right here um, and you get infinity on the second term as well but in fact what happens is that in the limit these two terms right here they approach infinity or they diverge at the same rate so you do indeed get a constant out the other side which is pi squared over six but uh yeah that's pretty much it for this video hope you guys enjoyed it and i'll see everyone in the next one bye bye